Okay, I left a, I left a blank in the notes there. Uh, so the title of the sermon is The Ministers of God. The Ministers of God. So you can write that in for your, uh, for your sermon notes. Good morning again and welcome. And, uh, and a wonderful blessing to be able to bring you the Word of God and to continue on with this uh, last instalment of this portion of Romans 13, which I've titled as a mini-series on its own, simply titled, God is Still on the Throne. God is Still on the Throne. The portion that we're going to be reading this morning or considering is going to be simply from verses 4 to 7. Let's read that again. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues tribute, to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks, dear Lord. We thank you, Father, for the work of our Lord. And I pray, dear Father, this morning you will break our minds to understand who are indeed the ministers of God. We would consider of those things, dear Lord, that perhaps we have not considered before, that you would help us, dear Father, also to submit to the truth of your word and that we might glorify your wonderful name in it. We praise you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But you've never thought of it that way. But you've never thought that government are actually the ministers of God. At least several times. Yes, certainly me. It's it's perished the thought, you know. Especially when you think of the governments that we have, we can't even conceive of that being true. It doesn't necessarily say that God agrees with everything that they do, but they are there for a purpose. And we're going to be seeing through this study this morning that that purpose is always for the same point and for the same direction. They are ministers to thee for good, but they are also ministers of wrath to those who are evil. We'll help bring an understanding of that this morning. I pray that it will be a blessing and it might perhaps soften your view with regards to these things and how we should live. So... Let's continue on. The minister for good is the first part of the message this morning. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. For good. But if thou should do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. God has laid out before us in this passage that which continues and expands upon the first verse of the passage and that is let every soul be subject unto the higher powers he expands on that and expounds on that and he brings us to an understanding of what the text actually says and confirms it every soul every person to whom he addresses in this letter every christian every one of us. There are none exempt from the command in this passage and there is no occasion short of direct disobedience to God's other orders in which this command is to be neglected. It's really that simple. Now Paul goes on after making clear to us in verse 2 that there is no power but of God and the powers that be are ordained of God. He goes on and helps us recognise that it is God that is in control. God is the one who has placed these governors in power. Now, without any contradiction, he continues on in verse 4 saying, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. He is the minister for good. I want to remind you first and foremost that we're dealing with the Word of God here. We're dealing with the Bible. This is the Bible. <laughs> it's, it's the Bible that's actually saying this. This isn't some self help book that you can take it or leave it. This isn't some idea that someone has sort of come up with that wants to keep you in subjection to something that is completely contrary to that which is good. This is the Bible. This is the Word of God. So it sort of doesn't do us very good to be able to come up with a whole bunch of but-ifs, you know, or yeah-buts, you know. Nothing of that is going to really help us a great deal 
in contradicting what we have before us. Paul is emphatic on this and is without any contradiction in the entire passage, nor is there anything else affirmed anywhere else in the Scriptures. There is no power but of God. That's a very clear, that's a very clear statement. And the powers that be are ordained of God in verse 2. And then verse 4, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. Not, not for evil, for good. How that comes to pass, we will consider this morning. The ministry of the powers that be, that rule and that govern us as much as, is as much important in this day as it was during the tyrannical rulers in the days of Paul. Paul is not some, saying something that we should have any question that, oh, well, he was under the authority of somebody that was benevolent, you know. He was under, I mean, Nero was such a loving guy, you know. Yeah, I know he killed his mother and he killed his children and it was probably safer to be a dog in the house of Nero than it was, is that? Sorry. Is that the angels of heaven? It was probably safer to be a dog in the house of Nero than it was to be a family member. But for Paul, he was a really nice, loving guy. You know, he was really careful and concerned about Paul. Maybe, I'm not sure if that was before or after he took off his head. This is the nature. This is the reality. We're dealing with a passage that was written by a man who was under the authority of an individual who was more tyrannical than we have ever experienced within our own lives. And yet he's saying the same thing, that he is a minister of God to thee for good. This is one of the things that we have to be able to recognise within the scriptures. God has made it abundantly clear in his word that the thoughts that he thinks towards us are thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. End. Note that, to give you an expected end. Jesus spoke of God having more care for us than the birds of the air that he feeds. He himself has numbered the very hairs on our head and he says that not even a sparrow shall fall from the earth, shall fall to the earth without his knowing it. And he says in all sincerity, fear not ye therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows in Matthew 10, 31. But somehow we think that the rulers that govern our day-to-day lives, God seems to have placed to work an evil work for an evil end against us and if we don't think that way we certainly too often act that way we ignore verse 3 for rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil and claim to suit ourselves thinking the opposite must be true rather than believing God and his word we're dealing with the word of God and at some point or another you're going to have to bend your knee to the truth of it irrespective of your temporary considerations of what the experiences are that you're going through. There's something interesting because we often think that the interpretation of our present personal experiences are justifiable to deny the truth of God's words in this passage. We come up with a multiplicity of yeah buts, as I mentioned earlier. We're constantly coming up with yeah but, you know. And we try and justify responding against our rulers the same way as those to whom the rulers are ordained to be a terror. We behave just as those who these rulers are ordained to be a terror. Yet they're not meant to be a terror to us. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Our confessed hatred of them betrays to us that we do not think God's word in this passage is fully true. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can relate to this, maybe not. Each time we see their faces on television or we hear their voices, we're sickened and we feel a loathing rather than saddened and feeling and filled with a longing. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. We are to have a longing for the Lord's coming without any doubt. But even more so, we need to be having a longing for their salvation. You see, that feeling that you have in the pit of your stomach when you see a particular government or a governor, his face on the television, turn it off, will you? can't stomach listening to that. 
that betrays where your heart's actually at. It really does, doesn't it? You have to admit, I had to admit to that. Okay, I'm, I'm not alone with regards to this. I know what it feels like. Um, I despise listening to deception. I despise listening to all of those things. It, it, it makes me very, very angry about the people that are being hurt and the people that are, whose lives are being destroyed. Yet the Bible continually tells us that these are ministers and they are acting out the wrath of God upon the evil. And you recognise that yourself. You speak to people on a day-to-day basis about the things that are going on and so many people are completely blind to it. They don't want to see it, they don't want to recognise it and they're going along with it. And this is whom the Lord has them as his ministers. You see, it's generally a lack of patience and understanding how God works that believes the difficulties that we're temporarily enduring are to work an evil end. And I know that this cannot be true. And I am also fully aware that many Christians have sorrowed of late for the diverse experiences that they've had and have been ordained by the powers that be. But please don't make the mistake of believing that the journey is the judge of the destination. We don't live life that way. We don't live life that way. We know that the bitter comes before the sweet. We recognise that within life. We know that as a music teacher, you'd know that as as students to music, that the pain of learning all this, that's aggravating, but that comes well before the sweet sound that actually comes from those fingers. It's the same thing of whether you're in business. You know that you've got to endure long hours. You've got to deal with a lot of suffering. You're probably going to go broke in the process until the riches of the rewards potentially can come through. We think that the end will justify the means in which we are enduring the difficulties that we're going through. We see that even with the raising of children. We know that there's difficulty involved in that, but if we're doing our job right as parents, even the difficult decisions that we make will have an end that will be a blessing to the entire family. See, we see this always on a day-to-day basis. We see a child has to go through growing pains to reach uh, adulthood. We we recognise that, um, you know, all of these things, that there needs to, there needs to be sacrifice. To get fit means you need to work hard physically, you know, all of that. We see this right through our life and yet for some reason we think that this basic training that we're enduring when it comes to the governors of this world is not to work out a good end. Within the somehow this suffering that we're enduring or the difficulties that we're going through is to work an evil work. But not to those who the Lord seeks to bless and to do good for. Somehow, he is able to make it work all together for good to those that love him. We see that. We've got that passage in Romans 8, 28. Probably one of my favourite verses that helped me endure so much in my life. Perhaps this is where there's an opportunity to show how the Lord works through the bad to bring about the good. So ask yourself a question. Is it a trial of your faith? Is the Lord doing a work to draw you nearer through that trial of faith? Is the Lord asking you, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you depend upon me? Will you have your rest in me? Will all your desires and burdens be laid upon me that I might show you my glory? How do you not know that that would be true? If all things work together for good to them that love God and you indeed love God, then everything that you're enduring in the world today should work to that good. These are ministers of God for good. They are ministers of God for good. They are ministers for good to them that love God. I want you to consider this as more as we go on. God is still on the throne. The powers that be are indeed ministers of God unto thee for good. Second point this morning is that they are ministers of wrath ministers of wrath Romans 13 verse 4 for he is the minister of God to thee for good but if note this but if thou do that which is evil be afraid for he beareth not the sword in vain for he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil for as much as 
our rulers and ministers of God to us for good, we are also warned here by Paul that we are not outside any risk of evil coming justly upon us when we do evil. Christians do the wrong thing in this, that do the wrong thing in this world aren't free of the punishments in this world. You think simply because you're a Christian and you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're born again and you're a, you're a child of God that you're not going to endure evil? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say that when you're outside of his will at any particular moment in time, the Lord chastises those who he loves. So you might endure a greater set of evil for a specific period of time. But also not necessarily there just because you have done evil either. The Lord might be bringing about a good that you might yet be a witness of. You might have some Job moments in your life. I've certainly had my fair share of them, you know, just to let me know that God is on the throne, you know, or maybe to remind me. If you do evil, then expect to be dealt with for your evil, for he beareth not the sword in vain. In other words, he has the arm of God, he has the sword, he has the strength and the power and the authority to enact that which God desires. I've sadly watched too many Christians on YouTube vent anger and abuse at the police because they disagree with how they're handling matters. I've seen Christians proclaim tremendous arrogance against law enforcement that looks no different to how the lost present themselves and it makes me wonder where our faith is at. If there's no distinction between how you're handling the current events and how others are handling the current events who have no hope, then you've got to ask yourself a question, where's your faith at? Where's your hope at? If your hope is in this life and in this world, then okay, that answers the question. If your hope is not, if you recognise yourself to be an ambassador of Christ sent into a foreign land and simply observing the things that are going on, looking to be able to share that hope in others, then your faith is probably in the right place. I know I have ebbed to and fro between those two positions, especially over the last 12 months. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Paul writes here excluding no one, but interestingly, specifically including Christians. Including Christians. He includes Christians in here. He's writing to the Romans, but if thou do that which is evil, it's a recognition. Governments do not bear the sword in vain. You know, the Old Testament is filled with examples of this, filled all the way through, where God has called the nation to obey the Lord and the nation has turned from the Lord, he then sent evil upon those who denied the Lord. But he blessed those who trusted in him. And we witnessed that last week when we had a look at some of those examples. The wilderness wanderings, he sent plagues and pestilences, even fiery serpents. From the garden through to the time of the Exodus and even well beyond the taking away of the nation into Babylon, God separated the good from among uh, the good, the, the, the wicked from among the just. He separated them and he did so by employing rulers to execute his righteousness. This isn't something new. God has worked like this from the garden till now, all the way through. We are this day living in a world where Wickedness and atheism has not seen such numbers since the time before the flood. Since the time before the flood. And it makes sense. Jesus' own statement who says, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We should not then expect to see wicked rulers. We should not then be surprised to see wicked rulers govern those who hate God. Should we? We shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be surprised at seeing that. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So be careful then, beloved. Be careful. Be careful to trust the Lord in this matter. Don't be, don't be caught up with the atheism of those who hate God. Believe him for good to you and pray for those who have no hope. The perfect example, Daniel 
was set as a prime minister of Babylon because he had the fear of the Lord and he trusted him rather than the politics of the land. Daniel was taken into captivity by a king of an evil empire that dominated the world at that time. And Daniel served him and was set as the prime minister, second in charge to Nebuchadnezzar over all the land. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, there were leaders refusing to be put under the yoke of the king. And the Lord chased them down to deal with them by the hand of the same king whom Daniel served. Another example is in Persia. Mordecai, an old man, a Jew, the cousin of Esther, who was himself taken captive out of Jerusalem when he was a child. He, was, he saved the life of the very one who kept him captive. Mordecai saved the life of Ahasuerus, the king of Persia at that time. Later, he was placed second in charge of the empire. You know the story. Read it. Esther chapters 9 and 10. Wonderful story, wonderful account. But back in Jerusalem, back in Jerusalem at that time, the rebellious Jews were attending to the very things that had them banished from the land to begin with and taking to themselves wives of the nation round about. And Ezra laments that in Ezra chapter 9. He sat, he saw what was going on. And I love this passage. He sat down astonished. Everything that they had endured was because of what they were going back to doing again. This is right at the end of the captivity. They'd already been released. They'd already been set free at this time. The time of Ahasuerus, the time of Esther, the time of Mordecai was already past the, cap the timing of the captivity historically. Okay, it was already gone beyond it. But that's what's going on. That's what's going on. And God was dealing with them. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. God remains on the throne. He remains on the throne of the world, irrespective of what people might think. He has charged the rulers of the world to do his will. He puts them in power, and when it suits his purpose, others he will pull down and he will replace. When it suits his purpose. But through them all he executes wrath upon him that doeth evil. Peter wrote... And 1 Peter 2, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king is supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. We have no ability to judge the manner of a matter, nor do we always have the wisdom to understand the method, but we believe God at his word. And we can always know the motive. We can always know the motive. To the good, this minister of God is the minister of God to thee for good. To the evil, this minister of God executes evil. Very simple. What I've done here is I've laid out the doctrine. You noticed? I've laid out the doctrine. And within that doctrine, I've also included a little bit of reproof. For you, for me, for all of us. But also, together with that, there's some correction. And how do we see God? How do we see God in his word? Do we trust him at his word, recognising our own limitations of understanding with certain things? And that's what we need to be doing. This next point is he is the minister for conscience. Minister for conscience sake. And that's something worth considering. Verse 4. Again, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Verse 5, wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. The 1980s was a time in China when the gospel was reaching fever pitch, particularly in the north. Mao's cultural revolution didn't quench the fire of the gospel, but instead precipitated the flame. But the 1980s, by the 1980s, Chinese Christian students started becoming increasingly bold for the gospel and they took seriously Jesus' proclamation, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Luke 14, 23. Chen Chao was one of those young men, one of those students. 
He and some friends initiated witnesses in the, witnessing in the streets, approaching strangers with the blunt proclamation of the gospel, teaching that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Or when the local police were warned them to stop, they ignored the warning. So the police tried to silence them by beating them with long lashing sticks. And during the beatings, the men began to gather crowds who looked on, and they looked on amazed, especially as the young men began to sing. Upon the cross, my Saviour died, the Son of God there crucified. And Chen Chao sang loudest of all, Oh, might I share and understand the cruel hurt that pierced his hand. The police ordered the men to get up and to go to their homes. It was truly a joy of the Lord in my heart, Chen Chao later told his wife, to think of it, insignificant and unknown Chen Chao, suffering for our Saviour's glory. We must go back again. And within a week, they did. A larger contingent of police came this time, each wielding a menacing cane, each moving quickly to curtail the illegal witness, once again, joyfully as before, the men sang of sharing Christ's suffering. Chen Chao sang loudest of all again. And the police sergeant who led the attack vented his rage against Chen Chao specifically. He not only struck the zealous man to the ground, but also beat him as he lay there writhing. God bless you, officer, Chen Chao called out. God bless you and save your soul. The Bible speaks of us being subject to wrath, especially when we have done no wrong. Especially when we have done no wrong. Jesus Christ was our example. He is the one that set the precedent for us. He is the one that set that. Chen Chao demonstrated the true heart of the Christian who knows his life is in the Lord's hands and he trusts him by faith. He knew that the officer was a lost man condemned to hell for all eternity. And he recognised clearly that Chen Chao's present sufferings was something worthy to be endured for the glory that will be revealed in him in the time to come. It was worth it. Matter of fact, he relished in it. He loved it. He thanked the officer for it and praised God that he would be singled out, worthy. And this is a picture that we have also in the New Testament with Peter and John also. Dealing with the same thing, they thought it a wonderful thing to be counted worthy to be suffering for the Lord's sake. He honoured the Lord's command to be subject unto the higher powers and he doesn't cry out for tentative rights as the lost do. He knows he has a freedom greater than the temporary one here and he obeys the Lord thinking himself blessed to be found worthy to suffer for Christ's sake. The third time, the young students went out to witness in the streets. The police were again notified by some of those who were being witnessed to. The sergeant that struck Chen Chao took a thick rod with him this time instead of a lashing stick or a cane. When he arrived on the scene, he went straight for Chen Chao and he struck him on the back of the neck. Chen Chao could barely stand conscious as he turned to see the same police officer from the last time. He smiled and just before blessing him received a merciless clout on the lower back and Chen Chao fell limp into the street. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 19 to 24. Peter writes beautifully here, and understand Peter also endured the same leadership and the same governance as Paul. And he writes in verse 19, 1 Peter 2 verse 19, he says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, 
When ye be buffeted for your faults, ye ye shall take it patiently. But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereto, hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. There is abundant reward with the Lord when we are willing to be subject to the wrath that he was. In sharing in his injustice and pain, we also have a share in his glory. We also have a share in his glory. For the good that God sees for you is not limited to this life, but extends to all eternity. This is how we reconcile the trouble we might face from time to time in this life. This is how we reconcile it. We don't reconcile it by determining that our current travel and our current journey determines our end. We reconcile it by recognising that when God sees your life, he doesn't see your temporary life. He sees your eternity. He has that entire scope in view. For when you're looking at the prosperity that the prosperity preachers preach today and limit it to this life, no, that cannot be reconciled with Scripture. Because we already know that many have endured the cross of Christ. Many have endured the difficulties and the pain. Many have suffered long suffering and yet their faith stood firm. They blessed the Lord through their trials. They thanked God when they were beaten. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The text goes on in Romans 13, 5. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. There are times when we deliberately flout the law of the land. Sometimes we break the rules and we do so on purpose. We break the rules and we do it on purpose. For most of my driving life, I felt that it was my right to catch up to and overtake the cars in front of me. I believed it was my life, my right. Um, The very fact that they had the audacity of leaving before me needed an answer. And I was always ready with my foot on the accelerator. Always there ready. The very fact that they were in front of me commanded me to overtake them. Didn't matter how far in front they were. You know, if I could see them, then they needed to be caught up with and overtaken. Passing each vehicle gave me a sense of accomplishment. Interestingly, however, though, that the relief of my conscience only ever came when I slowed down to the speed limit. There's this strange anxiety that occurs within us when we know that we're doing something wrong, but try to justify it in our minds. We find ourselves a bit anxious. Um, we, We find our conscience aggravates us and we very easily get quite tense and uptight. I've experienced that a lot, you know. We might go on doing this thing for many days. We might be doing it for weeks, months, even years. But the toll of a seared conscience can be damaging. The toll of a seared conscience can be damaging. To some, it affects their sleep. To others, it affects their health. To others, it reveals itself in impatience and in bouts of anger over seemingly small things. There's a whole bunch of different ways that this can actually manifest itself. When your conscience is struggling with doing things that are wrong and justifying it within your own mind. This is true of us as Christians who sin against the Lord, as well as being unwilling to be subject to those God has ordained to have the rule over us. 
Well, it's been almost four years now. Four years ago, I had the choice. Either lose my licence or do something that I have never done in over 30 years. And that is conscientiously obey the driving laws. I had to recognise that the privilege that I have in being permitted to be able to drive on these roads is something that is in every way a privilege. And to do so, um, to have the right to do so, I also had some obligations that I needed to maintain. And it wasn't until my mind changed on the entire idea that I started actually obeying the road laws for conscience sake. Yes, your pastor's been speeding around right up until a year after he started this church. You know? No doubt these days there's a lot of examples that I can use. You can select any one of those that apply to you. And there's a whole bunch of them, I'm sure, that apply to you. Especially today. Especially today. Your mind and your conscience needs to be clear to think on those things that matter the most. Your mind and your conscience should not be overtaken by your desire to be preparing yourself for an excuse for when somebody asks you why you're not doing such and so. You need to have a heart desiring and focusing on the things of the Lord. And the moment you do those things that are fairly insignificant, that are of consideration, whatever they are, you are free. Your conscience is clear. So we do so for conscience sake. We do so for conscience sake. We obey our rulers for conscience sake. Oh, by the way, that police officer that struck Chen Chao actually did break his back. He broke his back. But the story didn't end there. The injured man remained conscious as his friends carried him home. He continued praising God and thanking him for the privilege of such great suffering. As Chen Chao's wife looked on, his friends laid him tenderly on their bed. Thank you, Lord, he called out repeatedly. Thank you, thank you. Suddenly, all of those in the room heard a distinct and resounding crack, as if two stones had been struck together. Chen Chao became instantly silent. Then he sat up, his eyes widening, lips searching for words hands reaching for his back. His wife tried to restrain him. No, Taxtay, he promised. He protested. Then he stood up beside the cot. Jesus fixed it, he called out. My back, my back, Jesus fixed it. And his friends began to realise what had just happened. They joined him in exclamations of praise. After a moment, he held up his hand for silence and he said, come, Come, let's go to the police station. I must show the sergeant how Jesus fixed my back. News of the miracle. (laughs) News of the miracle spread across the community. And the astonished police sergeant became another of the many communist officials who have been touched by the manifestations of God's power so prominent in contemporary China, especially in the north. This is part of that biography that I finished reading a week ago. On, um, on Brother Lamb, Brother Samuel Lamb, called as bold as a lamb. We are a faithless bunch when we don't appreciate how God can work miracles within lives. The work that he does manifests his glory today as much as it did in days gone by. We have the word of God, which is a blessing to us. But the godless need sometimes some signs, something that demonstrates and shows that God is in control and that God is real. And God can do that. He can transform people's lives, even by their own death. We recognise the word martyr. The word martyr is the word that's defined as witness. That's what it means. It means witness. Those who are martyrs for the faith are witnesses to the faith. And the people of the world see their witness. The last point this morning. The minister to remunerate. The minister to remunerate. Verse 6. For this this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. 
Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Ah, money, money. The Bible says that it's the love of it that is the root of all evil. It's amazing how strongly we want to hold on to it. We treat it like it's our security blanket. We, we hold on to it even to the cost of our own integrity because of our love for it. But God wants to be our comfort and our trust. Yet far too many of us act as if our real comfort comes from the abundance of the money that we keep. I remember feeling that way. I remember feeling that all too well. And it makes me sick now when I think about it. Giving to the work of the Lord was the last major hang-up of my life. And once I began to do that, the hold that I had on money started slowly to release me from that captivity. It didn't happen overnight, but it certainly happened to the point that I have absolutely no concern about money whatsoever today. And it's not because I'm doused with an abundance of it. It's because by giving to the work of the Lord, I was able to be free from my hold that I had on it. I recognised what was more important than anything else. The Bible speaks, and this is not a small thing, because I was addicted to money from the age of 15 up until the age of 35. And when I say addicted to it, what I'm saying is that there was not a day that I never thought about it. There was not a day that went by that I didn't have within my mind the passionate desire to get it and to get as much of it as I can. <laughs> now I can't think of the last time I thought about it. You know? Usually when it runs out. That's often when I think about it when, it, when it runs out. But it never seems to completely run out, which I don't know how the Lord works it. The Bible speaks a great deal about supporting the work of the ministry of the Lord. But I'll bet that you never in your wildest dreams thought it might also relate to your taxes. <laughs> I mean, they are ministers of God. We happily give to the Lord to support his ministers at the pulpit who faithfully preach those eternal truths. But for this cause, pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Beloved, to you it is given to remunerate your ministers, those with the charge of your eternal life, but also those with the charge of your temporal life. How many of you have ever thought that paying tax was equated to remunerating a ministry? <laughs> I certainly never did, not until I studied this passage. I'm thinking, these are ministers. My well, goodness, we're paying tax, we're actually supporting God's ministers. Oh, but I don't like them and I don't think they're doing a good job and... They're not nice to me. Why should I pay for them? The conclusion, however, is inescapable. They are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. So again, to one ministry you give for the support of your everlasting happiness and to the other ministry you give for the support of your temporal happiness because they are ministers of God to thee for good. You almost got to say that in unison just to let it sink in. They are ministers to thee for good. They are ministers to thee for good. Jesus provided the clarity. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Pharisees came to the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to quiz him. They wanted to ask him some questions. They wanted to try and catch something out of his mouth in the hope that they can condemn him. They came there for one purpose and Jesus clearly had another. Mark chapter 12 and verse 14. And then when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. He saith unto them, Whose image 
Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marvelled at him. What a wonderful passage. What an incredible consideration. You are legally obliged to pay your taxes. And so you should. Do not avoid paying taxes illegally for conscience sake. For conscience sake. Doing so illegally and justifying it by keeping your money in your pocket, you will soon find, as I did, that your pockets end up with a massive amount of holes. Holes that you can't even see. What I discovered is that somehow God multiplies our wealth in ways that we can't explain and when we do the things that are right in his eyes, when we do things that are right for conscience sake. But when we sear our own conscience by taking away from that which God has already ordained for us to do, God has this interesting lack of or interesting ability of being able to devour that which we want to keep. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. But I, I was in business and there'd be millions of dollars that would pass through my hands. And <laughs> it'd be a lot like that. Go from here to there, then I had to dig back into my mortgage and pay more. Why? Because my focus was on doing on the, the Lord's work and the Lord's way. I wanted to try and skimp. I wanted to try and do things my own way. Why should I give? Why should I give to the Lord's work? I'm speaking about taxes here. You know, cash. Let's get some cash. I'm Italian. All right. Cash, Italian, synonymous. So we dealt with things that were wrong and we were searing our own conscience. And at the same time, the Lord had an amazing way because we weren't giving to his ministry. And again, I'm speaking about the ministers of God that work to thee for good. Because we weren't giving to his ministry the way he had ordained us to do, he would let us bring our money home in a bucket or in a pocket full of holes, bags full of holes. You don't believe me? Turn your Bibles to Haggai. Haggai chapter 1. Easier to start at Matthew and go back three books. Matthew, go back three books. You'll have Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai is the third book back from the book of Matthew. And chapter 1, right at the beginning. The people would not be doing the work of the ministry of the Lord. They wouldn't be supplying for the work of God's house and building God's house. They have been out of captivity for some time and they were comfortable in their own houses but would not be building to the work of the Lord's house. So the Lord here is dealing with them. Haggai chapter 1 verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes." Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much and lo, it came to little and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because mine house that is waste and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labours, the labour of the hands. It seems like there is nothing new under the sun. God still does exactly that today. God's ministry needs to be covered and it needs to be attended to. And when it is, the people are blessed and he rebukes the devourer for their sakes. I love that phrase. I think it's in Isaiah. I didn't look it up. But he rebukes the devourer for our sake. This was something that occurred to me time and time and time again. 
Matter of fact, I was actually giving to the Lord at the time. I was giving for the Lord's work for, for the church, not so much for the taxes. I wasn't making any money to pay taxes. But I was giving the work for the, for the church. And I remembered coming home, and because I was in a church that said, you give and you get, you know, if you give, you get, I looked at it as an investment. All right? I was waiting for the hundredfold increase. And so I did that. I, 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 would, I would give in order to get. And I'm not kidding you. There would be weeks that would go by that all of a sudden I'm, I, they're not paying me or I'm losing money or I've done this, I've done something. The money's been sucked completely out of our account. And I literally looked to Maria and I'd say, did we put in the tithes last week? You know? She says, yes, we put in the tithes last week. Oh, why is this happening? You know? Why? Because I was in a church that preached that if you give, you get. So my mindset and my heart was one of investment, not gratitude. It was one of investment. It wasn't one of desire to be a blessing to the Lord. Attitude. It's attitude. That's what makes a difference. That's the reason why you guys will notice there's never a bag that goes around the church. We leave a little box up the back. Because it is to be private. It is to be individual. It is to be conflicting of your own conscience and your own desire, not something for show. And so we do so deliberately because we do not want anybody to be anything but a cheerful giver. But this is exactly the same when it comes to your taxes, beloved. You know, by all means, do the Kerry Packer. Find every legal means to make sure that you don't pay more than you need to. Fine, but don't do that for the Lord. Give to the Lord abundantly because he blesses abundantly. Those who sow little reap little. This is the point here. Sometimes we have a catch when it comes to money and it's found even within this passage. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honour to whom honour. Do not be caught by the Lord loving money more than him. You cannot serve two masters. So, beloved, this concludes the one of the one of the most difficult portions in the book of Romans that I've preached so far. It's not difficult to expound. It's easy enough to expand. It's difficult because there's a tendency of a rebellious nature within each one of us, in, including your pastor. And, um, and it's also difficult because of the days in which we, we see ourselves. God is the one who remains in control of all things. We are charged simply to trust him at his word. We know how the chapter of this world ends and we're not ignorant to the days in which we live. We live in the times of the signs that Jesus spoke of. But the thing is, knowing this, there is an even greater responsibility on your part to trust him. And this is the bit that I don't get. That's the part that I don't understand. The part that I don't understand is if we already know that these things have come to pass, why are we behaving, what Christians are behaving, so aggravated when it is coming to pass? As if we've got to somehow slow it down, you know? Our work is one work and that is to preach the wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we're being distracted by that because we're being caught up in the affairs of this life, then we're not doing what the Lord wants. And we cannot reconcile that. We cannot reconcile that. We obey God when we obey those who have the rule over us. But let's also understand that we never disobey God when we are commanded to by those who have the rule over us. That's the only condition with regards to this. Does that make sense? We obey God when we obey those who have the rule over us, but we never disobey God when we are commanded to to do so by those who have the rule over us. That's where we draw the line. It's a very simple one. We're not to live our lives also as those who have no hope, beloved. We do not live as those who have their only hope. In this life, we are to live with the ever-present knowledge of eternity, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. There are some who are looking for the hope that you have. The hope that you demonstrate every single day by your joyful expectation of Christ. There's other people that are looking for that hope. You know, they're looking for that. They want to see that. They, want to, they need to see that. In, they need to see that somewhere. Why can't they see that in you? You know, why can't they see that in you? 
You know, you go to Bunnings, all right, your mouth can't smile because it's under a mask. Okay, let your eyes smile. You know, so these things here, apparently they're called smile lines. You know, let them show big and true, large. Let people know that you have a hope and a joy irrespective of what this world has to offer. That they might ask you, tell them, tell them that you were once like them, the servants of sin. Tell them, tell them that you now have your hope firmly, firmly entrenched in Christ and not in this life. Tell them that you now have a heavenly expectation that sees you loving others even in this life. With all its uncertainties, we live in hope and with joy and we're looking for and hastening unto the day of our Lord Jesus. Tell them that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the simple promise of the gospel. So live in the light of it. Yeah? Maranatha. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, dear Lord, we give you thanks and praise. A wonderful word of the living God. That in passages, dear Lord, where we find some difficulty and some struggles, dear Father, we see the wonderful truth and the wonderful joy and the wonderful light of it. We know, dear Lord, that it reconciles with all of Scripture and we know, dear Father, that we are here for your sake and to live lives, dear Father, that are glorifying to the kingdom of God and that emulate the wonderful truth of Jesus Christ. Help us grow, dear Father, in the love and the light of the gospel and bless us, dear Lord. Be with us continually. Strengthen us in our walk. And if you should tarry, dear Lord, that you'll bring us again together, that we might glorify your wonderful name. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.